monthly 88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.30. Up next, making contact. This week on Making Contact... Around the world, students have been taking to the streets. They're opposed to rising tuition fees and cuts to education. And in some places, their struggles have brought them wider support. So the student strike in Quebec is a movement of students, but not just students, also all other kinds of citizens from all walks of life and parents like us who brought our kids out to demonstrate as well for a different kind of Quebec and a different kind of future for our children. On this edition, we'll hear how students in Quebec helped bring down the government and why Chilean students are back out on the streets again. We'll also speak to an activist in Puerto Rico who says she's had enough of U.S.-style higher education. I'm George Lavender, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. With students demonstrating in countries around the world, we turn first to Chile, a country with a recent history of student activism, in 2012, Chilean high school and university students again took part in protests and strikes. Their aim? To change the way the government funds schools and universities, a policy first implemented in the 1980s under the US-backed military dictatorship. Making Contact producer Jorge Garaton has more from Santiago. Throughout 2011, Chilean students protested in the streets and shut down schools and universities. In high schools across the country, hundreds of thousands of students took part in a strike that lasted half the academic year. Some 250,000 high school students failed the year as a result. At times, the demonstrations were met with force as riot police used tear gas and water cannons against the students. In 2012, students again looked to the streets in large numbers. But what are the demands of the student movement in Chile? Mass student protests actually began back in 2006 when high school student movement and three-month student strike forced the government to change its education policies. The movement became known as the Penguin Revolution because of the students' appearance in their school uniforms. But the policy changes the student won still failed to meet their main demands to put an end to the privatized education system, increase funding to public schools, and stop providing one system for the rich and another for the poor. President of Catholic University Students Union, Norman Tittleman, told Democracy Now! to understand the reasons for the student struggle, we have to go back 30 years. The first thing to understand is that we have a very special educational system which was imposed during the 1980s in a, during the Pinochet dictatorship, which has one basic principle, and it's that the market always works. And we found out that obviously it's not that way. Under General Pinochet, the Chilean government began giving parents vouchers for education. Parents with enough money could use the vouchers to pay for some of the cost of sending their children to private schools and pick up the rest of the bill themselves. This newly created system fostered competition for funds and students and meant that only the children of middle and upper class families could attend these voucher schools. Since the end of the military dictatorship, these private schools have grown in numbers, leaving public education woefully underfunded and created a segregated school system with one system for the rich and another for the poor. In higher education, the same thing was also happening, with increasing numbers of universities profiteering from students. All of this started accumulating a lot of problems, a lot of inequalities, and uh, this exploded during the 2011, when we saw almost, uh, almost all of schools and universities of the country paralyzed for almost six months, over a million people in the streets. Carrying signs reading education not for sale, high schools and university students took to the streets. Ironically, the demonstrations were sparked when the Minister of Education proposed more funding for universities. The move 
was widely seen as lining the pockets of a wealthy elite in the education sector. Camila Vallejo is the former president of the University of Chile Students' Union and a familiar face during the 2011 student protest. She says the move was symptomatic of a wider problem in Chile. Behind closed doors, politicians are legislating, approving or rejecting laws and projects that benefit business interests instead of the great majority of the people. They're collaborating with those stealing from the people. The 81 Pinochet education reform is part of a broader, market-driven, neoliberal economic model. During all of these years, people have supported this market-driven educational model as they have supported a market-based approach in society at large because politicians have convinced them that profiteering is in their interest. Gabriel Boric, president of the University of Chile Students Union, told demonstrators during 2012 protests that the government of Chile and in particular the Minister of Education was helping the private education sector get rich at the expense of students. A minister of education who is a technocrat, who believes he can implement his authoritarian agenda without consultation. We, the students, warn him that if he continues to favor the business interests of those who profit from our rights and our dreams, we will answer with more protests. This president and his minister of education gloat about having voted no during the referendum that ended the Pinochet dictatorship. But we denounce that we moved from a military dictatorship to a market dictatorship. A market dictatorship that we will fight on the streets at any cost. The government says they're reforming the educational system by increasing the number of scholarships for low-income students, funding to schools, and tightening regulation of the private education sector. Student activists say that these small concessions aren't enough, and they've kept up their campaign for publicly funded education. Following the 2006 high school student protest, Mario Weisbluth helped found Educación 2020, a non-governmental organization which campaigns for public education and against voucher schools. In the last year, students have marched against segregation, against the for-profit education system, and in favor of public education. Up until now, the government has responded with legislation which puts private education above public education. With tax reform that gives tax grants to parents who have children in voucher schools, they are further encouraging the migration from public schools to private education. The government has not responded to the students' demands. In fact, it's taken the opposite approach. At the heart of the student struggle is the demand for an end to the four profit system in education and in favor of well-funded quality public education. Student leaders say that both the current government and previous administrations have failed to meet these demands, instead allowing the market to dictate where educational resources are allocated. Spokesperson for the high school's students' national coordinating committee, Eloisa Gonzalez, explains how they are trying to change that. The secondary education movement is beginning a new process of mobilizations as continuation of the 2011 movement because it failed to achieve real gains from the government. So students will strike, will shut down schools. We are organizing towards new demonstrations and protests by secondary students. Although the student movement in Chile have won some concessions from the government, they still have a long way to go if they are to realize their demand for good quality free education. For Making Contact, I am Jorge Garrotón in Santiago. Chile is not the only country to have seen student protests in recent years. In Puerto Rico, students went on strike in 2010 and again in 2011. Teresa Cordova Rodriguez is a student at the University of Puerto Rico and was a member of the Students in Defense of Public Education Committee during the strike. She's currently the spokesperson for the Socialist Youth Union, part of the Socialist Workers' Movement in Puerto Rico. Teresa Cordova Rodriguez, thank you for speaking with Making Contact. 
Thank you, George. Could you start by telling us why you decided to go on strike? Well, in Puerto Rico, there were two student strikes, as you well said, in 2010 and 2011. The first one was in spring of 2010 due to the elimination of what we call the certification num number 96, which gave uh, exemption of tuition fees to students that were talented. We occupied the university and we camped there for 62 days. It was a very popular strike here in Puerto Rico. And during that strike, uh, we received the news that we were going to have a tuition hike on 2011 of $800. And that led to the second student strike in 2011. Tell us about that. The strike in 2011 uh, was totally different. The student strike uh, implicated a more direct confrontation with the police and with the state, and implicated also that because of that confrontation, we couldn't stay inside the university. The university was not occupied, so the students had to change their means of protesting. And what we did was that we tried to interrupt the universities and the administration's work going in every day in, of the, in the university, manifesting inside the university and on the streets close to the university or in front of places that represented the capitalist interests of the government of Puerto Rico. How successful were those strikes? Well, the first student strike, uh, which was for the certification number 96, was um, successful. The certification never passed. But the second student strike uh, did not uh, achieve what we were looking for, which was the elimination of the new 800 hike to the tuition fee. We're currently paying $800 more in our tuition, which in Puerto Rico is a significant uh, amount of money. If you consider, for example, that a teacher here in Puerto Rico earns about 18 thousand dollars a year um and that's a good salary here in puerto rico eight hundred dollars represents a lot to working class students especially when the university uh, costs a lot for us which is like two thousand dollars a semester we've been listening to the story of the student movement in chile what are the similarities with your experience in puerto rico both uh, student movements uh, have been striking to get a, a better education for working class and poor people here in Puerto Rico and also in Chile. Uh, in Puerto Rico, public education, public higher education is not accessible to working class people. Uh, it is very elitist, as is in Chile. A lot of the students that get into the public uh, system of education come from the five highest costly uh, private schools here in Puerto Rico and as I've been reading in Chile uh, it also happens the same the students that get into public universities which should be accessible to working class people and poor people in Chile are students that have had a better education in the sense that they have been uh, they have had the privilege to say in some way of going to uh, more expensive schools and better schools we're speaking with Teresa Cordova Rodriguez, a student activist in Puerto Rico. After the break, when the government of Quebec tried to raise tuition fees, students fought back. We'll hear more from Teresa Cordova Rodriguez about the importance of international solidarity. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and South Africa. Find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts. Go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. For six months in 2012, students in Quebec took part in a strike against a hike in tuition fees. Inspired by students in Chile and elsewhere, they left their classes and took to the streets in large numbers. Beginning in February 2012, the strike quickly grew and by March, more than 300,000 students were refusing to go to class. From Montreal, Making Contact producer Lillian Bokter finds out what happened next. Everywhere I go in Montreal, I still see people of all ages wearing the red squares that came to symbolize the student strike against the government's hike in fees. What does the red square mean and why are students still wearing it? I asked Lia Peltier Marcotte, a student at McGill University. The red square means that we're in the red, which means we're deeply indebted. And it became a symbol for the protests, the student protests and the ones that were against the tuition hikes. 
I keep wearing it just to show that I was part of this movement that prevented the tuition heights to go up, but also to promote universal education and accessible education. So it was a student strike. I asked Michelle Hartman, a professor of Arabic literature at McGill University in Montreal and a mother. So the student strike in Quebec is a movement of students, but not just students, also all other kinds of citizens from all walks of life and parents like us who brought our kids out to demonstrate as well for a different kind of Quebec and a different kind of future for our children. Called the Maple Spring by some, the strike that began in February included more than 300,000 students refusing to go to classes at its peak. They opposed the Quebec Liberal government's plan, led by Premier Jean Charest, to raise student fees by more than $1,500 over five years, an increase of 75%. The students' worries are not unfounded. Quebec's tuition has increased 140% in the past 20 years, about three times the rate of inflation. I was at the massive March 22nd demonstration in 2012 where hundreds of thousands of determined students filled 50 city blocks with a sea of red, dancing, singing, and chanting for hours in the unusually warm first day of spring. Salom Nathalie is an 18-year-old student of human sciences at Boisboulon College in Montreal. She's one of an increasing number of students struggling to make ends meet. At the March 22nd demo, she told me she's worried how the tuition increase will affect her studies. I'm here uh, because I'm not going to be able to pay for university. I'm going to have to work uh, part-time jobs. My friends are not going to be able to pay, and I'm there for them too. Jeremy Bedardouin is a co-spokesperson for CLASS, the largest of the three student associations behind the student strike. Throughout the strike, critics kept repeating that Quebec had the lowest tuition fees in North America, with students paying around $2,500 per year on average. By comparison, four years of tuition at a public university in the United States can cost more than $20,000, while private university goers often pay double that. I met with Jeremy Bedardouin in a Montreal cafe and asked him about Quebec's low tuition rates. Well, if we have the lowest tuition in North America, it's not because we have better political elites. It is because we have struggled. This history of struggle dates back to the first general strike in 1969, which led to the creation of the modern Quebec university system. And time and time again, we reacted to every attack on this accessible network that was created in the 60s and managed to uh, keep tuition the lowest in the country, but also to maintain the quality of education. You can fund public services properly through other means than user fees. Students kept the strike alive through daily actions and nightly marches, but there was also repression. Throughout the spring, downtown Montreal was often filled with tear gas, noise bombs, flashbang grenades, rubber bullets, and students fleeing or resisting against baton-wielding police. Many students were severely injured, including two students who lost an eye. In total, more than 3,000 students were arrested. Jeremy Bedard explained how he saw the movement in Quebec as connected with progressive struggles all over the world. As the strike wore on and as they were met by complete indifference from the government and as they held protests that were violently repressed, and as they freed themselves from the traditional constraints of education by going on strike, they reflected on the tuition hike and realized that this was part of a larger problem. From the minute they realized that, the strike became much more powerful, much more threatening to elites. And from the eighth week, you know, the government made offers, another offer, another offer, and the students didn't bulge. And they even voted in greater numbers in favor of the continuation of the strike because they were now part of a much more threatening movement. They realized the power that they had and the strike continued. The government really hoped that their offers uh, would kill this movement because they thought that this movement was about numbers. And when Bill 78 was announced, when all of those offers failed, uh, when all the negotiations stalled, then the broader population came into play. In May 2012, the Liberal government passed Bill 78, which later became Law 12, La Loi Especial, or the Special Law, which made demonstrations of 50 or more people without prior police approval illegal, restricted any protests or picketing near universities, and threatened those breaking the law with thousands of dollars in fines. The measure was aimed at combating the student strike, but the government didn't count on the response of thousands of Quebec citizens. 
Throughout the province, at 8 p.m. every evening, people came out on their balconies and stood at their windows and banged on pots and pans to show their dissent. The pot banging protests, which became known as Le Casarol, soon turned into neighborhood marches and protests in the street and led to neighborhood assemblies, where local residents gathered to make decisions about their communities together. I met Elise Ross at the monthly mass student demonstration in August 2012. I'm participating in a neighborhood assembly that was built throughout the student movement. The power is closer to me and we decide together, so it's like direct democracy, which I think is more interesting than this electoral system we have right now. Even though the student strike started with very concrete and specific demands about rolling back the fee hikes, the strike became focused around the larger issues of neoliberalization. Kevin Paul is a student at McGill who participated in the class committee responsible for maintaining and enlarging the strike. I spoke with him in September 2012 at the McGill Law School where he had just entered his first year. It was never just about, you know, blocking a tuition hike. It was about, for a lot of us, resisting the continual intervention of a market logic into more and more areas of our lives, education being something that is being commodified in an ongoing way, the tuition hike just being one symptom of that. As the strike ground on, public opinion turned against the Liberal government, which called an election in September. The student movement was a major factor in costing the Liberal government the election, and on September 20, 2012, the newly elected Parti Québécois repealed the tuition fee hike and Bill 78. Jérémy Bédardouin says the student victory cannot be attributed to the Parti Québécois. This victory is not the PQs, it's not a result of the electoral process, it's rather the result of the immense amount of popular pressure first through our general strike and then through the popular revolt from May onwards. And Jérémy Bédardouin emphasizes how crucial international solidarity was in maintaining the morale of the Quebec student movement during the long months. The Québécois government made every effort it could to isolate students. It created this dichotomy between um, the students, uh, or the street, as we, he calls us, and the rest of society. And this was very hard for us, for on strike, to be hit continuously with government propaganda, media propaganda, the solidarity as propagated by social networks. Really made us stronger. The attacks that we faced as students were very similar from country to country. Neoliberal policies in education are applied everywhere. You could talk about Chile, where they have one of the worst education systems in the world and yet are fighting for free education. Class will continue to fight for free post-secondary education in the province. And whatever happens next, Bedard says the Maple Spring has empowered and transformed Quebec students and inspired people worldwide. Our generation is often pegged as this general cynical generation that isn't interested in politics, uh, very individualistic. Um, I think this was proven wrong, first of all. Those students who have been uh, shot by police, who have been um, beaten up by their batons, who have been pepper sprayed, did not hold a, a particularly radical um, worldview prior to the strike. This was something that they, they learned. Uh, during the strike, and this will stay with them for the rest of their lives. That was Lillian Bokter reporting for Making Contact from Montreal in Quebec. Still with us on the phone is Teresa Cordova Rodriguez, a student activist from Puerto Rico. We just heard from Quebec about how the student movement there has fueled other movements for social justice. Did the same thing happen in Puerto Rico? A lot of uh, other organizations, political organizations, the teachers, the workers in the government were uh, trying to help us in our strike and were trying to mobilize themselves out of what we were doing in the strikes. So yes, there was for a couple of uh, weeks a uh, kind of feeling that things were going around in the country, that other people were standing up. Students in some schools around the island were doing stuff also. For example, uh, students that didn't have English teachers or math teachers suddenly uh, began to rise up in their schools also. Those news uh, were not uh, publicly shown in the commercial media, but while we were on the strike, we could see that some of the things that we were doing were having repercussions in other aspects of Puerto Rican politics and society. 
On today's show, we've heard from Chile and Quebec, but in recent years, students have taken to the streets around the world in places like France and Italy and the UK, where I'm from. Do you think there are some common factors in these struggles? Definitely. Um, it's not a casualty that while we are having a global crisis, which is nothing else than a crisis in the capitalist uh, manner of the world's organization, uh, things have been happening, especially in the students' fronts. One of the main places where we have seen budget cuts and one of the first places where we have seen budget cuts all around the world have been in the education uh, departments and in the education systems all around the globe. So yes, definitely there's a vinculation uh, between everything that's happening here in Puerto Rico and in the States and in France and in the UK. And the same model that they're trying to impose in Europe is the model that the United States, that in Puerto Rico we have, you have to pay for your college. There's not much uh, state funding for investigations, for students, uh, for uh, grants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, definitely there's a vinculation between everything that's happening all around the globe and in Puerto Rico also. And talking about the U.S. model for higher education funding, do you think there's a relationship between the student struggle and the movement in Puerto Rico for independence from the United States? Definitely. Political organizations have had a, a very important role in what has happened in Puerto Rico, especially independentist uh, political organizations. They have been the ones who have been since the beginning, organizing since when nothing was happening, have been still working uh, for a better public education, for a more democratic uh, education, for a more open uh, university system. And of course, there's also a revindication of that, that Puerto Rican students uh, do not want, we do not want uh, a university system that is similar to the United States. We struggle. Uh, to have a university system that is similar to what we hope that we have in our country and it's an independent, democratic, autonomic uh, university system as we do want in our country also. And finally, what lessons do you think students here in the United States can learn from Puerto Rico? What I always say when, when some type of question like that comes up is that a year before the student strike in here in Puerto Rico, we thought that it wouldn't be possible. I correct myself. We didn't even think about striking. We were, we have been for almost five years uh, with nothing happening in the university, with our heads a little down, and just a few of students every day doing little work, what we call trabajo de hormiga, ant work, to build something and eventually uh, something happened. Of course, that was in a context. It was in the context of Law 7, with, which uh, implicated the dismissal of, of, lo of a lot of Puerto Rican workers, and, it implic and in the context also of other measures taken in our country, and of course in the context of a Republican Tea Party uh, governor in, in our country. But what we always try to say is that even though it seems hard, even though it might uh, sound difficult and impossible, it is difficult, but it's not impossible. That was something that the Tupamaros used to say in Peru, and it's something that we try to to use every day to uh, to build something better and to build a better society. And that was what we did in the university, and that was what hopefully will happen in a lot of other places in the world, including the United States, as we have seen in Canada, as we have seen in Chile, as we saw in Spain uh, in the last couple of months. So that would be it. Keep on working, keep on building with the little work of ants, and something might happen and some, a little spark might go off. Teresa Cordova Rodriguez, thank you for speaking with Making Contact. Thank you very much. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Música de resistencia. For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736. Or check out our website, radioproject.org, to get a podcast, download past shows, or make a difference by supporting our work. Like Making Contact on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. I'm George Lavender. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. 
The following is a statement by a candidate in the KPFA Local Station Board election. Hi, I'm Karen Pickett, and I'm a candidate for the KPFA Local Station Board. I've been an activist since the 70s with Earth First, many environmental campaigns, and on social justice issues. KPFA is our commons, reflecting the diversity we have here in the Bay Area. I believe we can have the voices of Occupy, voices of peace, and voices for fundamental change and have a democratic process. To survive, we must be united, as we've been in the past, when thousands were out in the streets defending KPFA in Pacifica. I hope I can help and ask for your vote for myself and my colleagues at United for Community Radio. Thank you. The preceding statement by the candidate does not necessarily reflect the views of the station or its staff. More